Hey guys, welcome back to Medical Coding with Blue. It is Q&A Tuesday. If you are brand new to my channel, welcome. I am Blue, I'm a medical coder. I have been a medical coder for over 10 years. I really love to share the things that I know with all of you. So I hope you'll take a second, hit that subscribe button, smash that like button, and at the end of this video helps you, I hope that you will share it. So let's get started. All right, what is Q&A Tuesday? Q&A Tuesday is a show where I take all of the questions that have been submitted by viewer comments, through emails, through Instagram, and I put it all into one episode. So here we go. And thank you to everybody who submitted a question. All right, first question. Do you know any online schools that are legitimate that offer medical billing and coding programs? The only ones that I can legitimately recommend are the ones directly with the associations themselves. There's the American Health Information Management Association, or AHEMA, uh, as it's called and AAPC, the American Academy of Professional Coders. Both of them have online programs for medical coding. So if you're interested, you can go directly to either one and they, they run roughly about the same. There's a couple of differences between the two, but I will leave the direct link for AHEMA's program down in the description box below because it is a little difficult to get to. But that is the only associations that I can truly say, the ones that are online. Yes, there are plenty of different uh, trade schools out there. I will be doing a video about choosing between online and you know a trade school itself. The thing that you need to look for, if you're not going to go to the association websites themselves, which are a fraction, by the way, a fraction of the cost, uh, if you're not going to go through them and you're going to insist on going to a trade school either online or in person, as much as you can right now, right? Um, just make sure that they are training you for either a HEMA or AAPC credentials, right? Because if you want to be a medical coder, those are the credentials they are looking for. There are other associations or companies out there that say that they offer medical billing and coding certificates. It's not what employers are looking for, guys. If you look for uh, medical coding job listings, they are asking for a HEMA or AAPC credentials. So that's my advice on that one. Next question. I always thought that resumes were to be one page. <clears throat> so what the viewer was referring to is I did a resumes um, tips video for beginners and I said the max is two pages on your resume. Now that, that said, if you have one page, that's great. But I always say the max is two pages. Ideally, you do have one page, but you can only have up to two pages. Now, the reason that I said this was because I was getting lots of emails from people sending me their resumes. Now, I, don't do that, guys. Don't do that. I, I can't do anything with your resumes, okay? Honestly, I can't. And <laughs> But some of these resumes were like three and four pages, and I'm like, no, 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 no. <laughs> and I think that sometimes we're not taught how to write a good resume, and so I think that that sort of has a lot to do with it. So keep your resumes to at least two pages. The max is two pages, all right? And then you got to have your cover letter, and your cover letter is got to say all about what you are going to bring to the table, okay? Now, I will probably leave the link for the resumes video down in the description box so I don't have to keep repeating. <laughs> all right, next question. How do you know what coding software the hospital you apply to uses? So one of the tips that I had given was to uh, do research about the place that you are wanting to apply. And if they tell you what the coding software that they use, sometimes, for example, they will say uh, Epic Experience Preferred. So then you know that that facility uses Epic. And Epic is an electronic health record or electronic medical record, okay, EMR, EHR, you know, <laughs> that is what that is. So if you know this, you can look on YouTube at the tutorial videos. Now, this is the, the, the medical record, okay? It's not an encoder, it has nothing to do with the coding. But going on these tutorials for on YouTube for like Epic, for example, is gonna give you an edge because yes, while you have no experience being a brand new coder, it doesn't mean that you can't get a step ahead and say, okay, well, in your cover letter, I've been watching uh, YouTube videos on Epic because I noticed that your facility uses Epic as your electronic health record. So, you know, going a step above and beyond, I went in and checked out that video and I'm very excited and I want to uh, pursue this career. Something like that is going to show that you are putting forth the effort. Now, you have to actually look at the video and watch it, okay? So, don't just say that you're doing something, all right? <laughs> and then you don't do it because you may be called out for that, okay? Now, 
if it's if it's not epic if it's something else then then by all means it, go with whatever tutorial video believe it or not there's tons of tutorial videos on electronic medical records okay tons of them so at least you know how to navigate a little bit you're a little bit ahead of the game and believe me they're not going to be expecting that especially from somebody that has no experience in in medical coding at all so just my advice next question how many hours a day do you think you should spend studying medical terminology for medical billing so it is important that even if you are not doing medical coding and that you're just doing medical billing it is important for you to know medical terminology as far as like how much time people should spend doing studying it's going to be on the individual everybody's um ability and and thought process is different right and everybody's study habits are different so it depends on you okay the thing that you want to remember is don't burn yourself out it's a marathon it is not a sprint okay so don't try to memorize tons of words just memorize the prefixes the suffixes and the root words of medical terms so that way you could piece it together all right because it's going to make it a lot easier there is no sense in trying to memorize all of these words when you can just memorize or you can just remember the uh, prefixes suffixes and root words then you could piece it all together and it'll be much easier for you all right so um, that is my suggestion on that don't think that you have to memorize everything i've been 10 plus years in and i'm still learning medical terminology and sometimes even i have to look up words <laughs> so and i'm a reader so that should tell you something right there you're going to constantly learn in this field this is something that you can't just say well i went through school and then i'm not going to study again because yes you are you are always going to have to study okay so next question i have been offered a job as a trainee clinical coder i don't know whether to accept the job or not i am just so nervous hearing about all the training involved <laughs> take it take it because you never know if you're asking me my advice take the job if they offer it to you take the job this is a coding trainee um job now you may not ever get a, a good chance like this right so if they're offering you the job they see something in you that is potentially really good okay this is a coding trainee job clearly they know they have to work with you that you have no experience previously right and of course things are going to sound like a lot to you because you're brand new <laughs> you're brand new you've never done this before of course it's going to sound like a lot but they're going to tell you everything so that you are aware now as far as like the detail of this stuff how do you know that these are just not like very mundane tasks that are very easy it just sounds like a lot jump on that job if they offer it to you take it okay because you never know how much longer you'd have to go out and be looking for a job you need experience so if you have to take a job that is very entry level the first time that's fine just get your experience get your time in and then move on at least that's just my advice all right <laughs> next question I am so confused though about the fact that you also need experience for the CCS and the CCS if you don't know is a certified coding specialist and that is offered with AHIMA okay um, will they give me the certification for the CCS if I pass the exam even though I have no experience or is the test even passable if you don't have experience so here's the thing with the CCS you have there is an educational requirement on it if you have no previous experience all right so there's two ways you can get it by going through an approved AHIMA program right and then they'll teach you everything that you need to know and then of course you you pay to take the exam and you take the exam and then you know you go on from there but the thing is they do recommend having experience if you have time in already with another credential like if you're if you've, if you've been a CCA or a um, CCSP and you have had time or you've been through one of the degree programs and you have had time in the field already and you want to go ahead and take the test 
and you don't have to go through an approved AHIMA program because you can just sit for the exam because you've had time in, you've had the, the required amount of time in. So with that, then they say, yes, you, you should have some experience. This one credential, the CCS, is the gold standard of medical coding credentials. Why? Because this one credential <laughs> says that you can code both inpatient and outpatient, that you know the rules for inpatient and you know the rules for outpatient. This is a tall order <laughs> to, to meet, okay? So that's why they say if you um, don't go through a program that if you've had time in, you should have had experience previously because it should help you, okay? So that is the reason for that. Uh, if you take the test, you're eligible to take the test uh, and you pass, of course, they have to give you your, your credential. That's not, there's not even a question to that, okay? All right, next question. I am just curious about how versatile and interchangeable the RHIA and the RHIT are because I think in your video you mentioned <clears throat> that the RHIA that was interning with you wasn't too familiar with the coding aspect. All right. If you don't know, <clears throat> the RHIA is the Registered Health Information Administrator. This is the bachelor's degree. It is offered um, with... Uh, the American Health Information Management Association, it is their designation that you have to go through an approved program from them, okay? And, and it's offered in the colleges and things like that. So if you get the RHIA, this is the bachelor's degree. These are the people that are like at the head of the table. These are the managers, the, the head administrators that are running whole departments. They focus on the managerial side of the house, the administrative side of the house. They're the ones that look at the data. They're the ones that look at the forecasts. They're the ones that manage the money. They're the ones that do all of that, that stuff, right? The big, heavy managing stuff. And then you have the RHITs, which is the Registered Health Information Technician. Now, this is the associate's degree, also offered with the American Health Information Management Association. And they're the ones that are doing like the supervising. They're the ones that are doing like lead code work and things like that. And they do like auditing and things like that. They're basically like the deputy to the RHIA, right? So they answer to that person when you think in terms of like a chain of command, right? And then that RHIT manages the coders. So with that said, <laughs> um, RHIAs are not going to be spending their time doing the coding. Uh, a couple of years ago now, <laughs> I had the wonderful privilege of having a coding student who was um, externing for his RHIA uh, come and sit with me for a day and we worked together and coding was not his strong suit. Like he, he could do the math and he could do the numbers for like the business side and he was totally comfortable with that. But when it came to the coding, they get very little training. They get some training in coding, but it's not intensive as a coder. Okay. So that was why he didn't know. And as far as like it being interchangeable, no, these are pretty much in their, in their job descriptions, what they are. Okay. Are there some coders that are RHIAs? Sure. But they usually have a, um, a coding designation as well, like a CCS. Okay. So they have something like that in addition to their RHIA. Um, but yeah, that would, that's, that's the answer on that one. Okay. So <laughs> next question. Can you use your books when taking the test? Because I feel like it's impossible to know every code for every word by heart. If somebody knows every code, <laughs> they are a miracle worker. <laughs> but yes, you can use your book and you can use your book in the test. You can use your um, book at work. Okay, so you can use your book. Yes. All right. Next question. I wanted to know if you had any advice on an easier way to learn the guidelines. I am currently in a coding program and I find myself feeling overwhelmed with trying to be familiar with all of the guidelines for ICD-10-CM. See, here's the thing. Sometimes people are under the misconception that they have to memorize things. And there was somebody that commented the other day on, on one of the videos. He said that he thought that somebody had told him that that all coding was, was memorization of codes. No, 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 no. It's the same for the guidelines as well. You don't have to memorize them, guys. You just have to learn them. Again, this is a marathon. It is not a sprint. You're not going to be asked to recall off the top of your head these ICD-10 guidelines. Now, I recommend 
doing the old fashioned stuff, which when it comes to these guidelines is just reading them. So I had another viewer who commented that in her class that once a week that they would literally read the guidelines top to bottom once a week, just read the whole thing once a week. And even though you're not memorizing it, your brain is storing this information. And when it's storing this information, it's going to be easier to recall. So just reading and going through those motions of reading is going to help you be able to recall and know that you've seen these guidelines, you remember them after a while, because if you're consistent with it, you'll be able to recall these much more quickly, much more easily. But don't try to sit there and memorize it because it's a lot. That document is pretty big, okay? So don't try to memorize it, but just read it. And there is no magic pill when it comes to learning this stuff. I think people, sometimes when they're writing in, they want that magic pill. They want to know what is the secret uh, to, to memorizing this stuff or what is the crack the code type stuff. That is when I see stuff like that, that cracking and, and, and trying to, to memorize and, and no, 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 no. All you're going to do is bring yourself out that way. And these like these speeding programs that that are very like the boot camps that are really short and things like that. And they're really big on that. You know, they you know, they're going to teach you to crack the exams and things like that. There is none of that, guys. And sometimes when people are saying, well, I felt like I just went through this program and they just taught me how to pass the exam. A lot of times that's what they're doing because they have your money and they, they need you to pass so they can have their their good scores that they helped this many people pass. But really, is it, are you learning? Are you learning these rules? Are you learning the, the guidelines and things like that? Because there's a huge difference between passing a test and being able to actually work when you get out in the real world and really understand what you're doing. And a lot of times they'll say, well, you know, uh, wherever you go, they'll train you how to code. Not true. Not true. Unless it's already established in the, in the listing that yes, if you're brand new, we'll train you. But a lot of times they're going to expect you to know how to code guys. And you can't expect your employer to teach you how to code because they're going to tell you, we're only going to show you like how to use the electronic health record and um, how to use the encoder. But that's it. Like the rules you got to know, but yes, you can ask questions, but the fundamental basics guys, you got to know those things. So I'm just saying next question. Um, is, oh, here we go. <laughs> okay, here we go. Is the pay and salary for this career good? Some websites say that the median salary is around, I'm not going to say. Is this true? Will certifications allow me to have a higher salary than the median? All right. You can go on the Department of Labor or the Bureau of Statistics and be able to find out what we make, right? What is the, the starting salary? Here's the deal. A lot of times these, these uh, coding trade schools and things like that, they'll try to, to give you like the highest number um, about what medical coders make. And they'll say it's up to, and they'll, they'll give this ridiculously high amount. The <laughs> aspiring attorney in me knows to look at the language, all right? Up to does not mean that is where it starts, okay? Median, all right? Median, and it's, the median salary is going to be different everywhere you go. And people get upset with me because I don't like to talk about money. My channel is about medical coding. Yes, the salary does get pulled in. And I'm only going to answer this question, all right? So when they say about, um, she wanted to know about the salary, and if you got all these other um, credentials, would it help? No, it's not going to help. If you are starting out brand new, you need to start out with one credential. Now think about this. Medical coding is a wonderful field in the fact that we do very well for ourselves financially, right? You can have, you have to have a high school diploma or a GED to start. And then you, you sit through a nine to 18 month program. You get your certification and then you're out in the real world. Think about this guys. We don't have to go to college to make this money. And if the median salary is too low for you, remember, it is just the median salary. It is just barely what they start at. So you're not going to stay at that salary point forever. If that salary is not enough for you, 
then choose another field. But this field does pay well. But a lot of times people will get into it because they see the money and that is where their focus is. And they don't really apply themselves because they want to try to get to the easiest so that they can just make that money and then that's it. You're doing the facility, the patient, and yourself no favors when you don't apply yourself, okay? And yes, I know I went and veered off the topic of the salary, but it, I believe it goes hand in hand, which is why I don't like to talk about it. I don't like to talk about it because when I want people to come to my channel, I want them to know that they're going to get the realness. They're going to get the real talk <laughs> about the field and what goes on. You know, the salary, you can look up in your area, and I've said it plenty of times. And, you know, if, if that is not good enough for you, well, then there's plenty of other fields. Okay, so next question. Is this career fun and exciting? I've seen some say that it's repetitive, stressful, and boring. What, what do you find exciting or fun about your job? everything. I really love being a medical coder and I don't know where in my life I would be if I wasn't a medical coder. I work hard every day and somebody actually commented one time, well, you look really tired at the end of the day in your videos. Well, that's because I've given 120%. That's why. Well, uh, oh yeah, your life is just all about coding. No, I have other things too. I do other things. <laughs> I do other things, but my channel is about medical coding. And I love what I do. And I like reading. I like learning. This is a lifelong learning process. And I feel lucky that I know this, right? I feel lucky that I had my aha moment in 2014 where I realized that this is not just a job, it's a career. Because some people never get that lucky. Some people work their entire lives at their job. And then when they retire, they say, what, what did I do with my life? I was in a job that I hated for so many years. Why didn't I just change? And I have the gift, the incredible gift of saying, I have a career that I love. I love my career. Do I have hard days? Sure. Do I have days that it's just like, wow, what just happened? <laughs> yes, I do. But then I look at the days that are so incredible when I, when I learn something, when I have a really good class, when I give a class or something, and that's me. That's what I love. I love to help people and I love the intelligent people that I work with. Yes, some of them are quirky, but that's okay. I'll take their quirkiness all day long because that to me makes life interesting and I'm happy. I'm happy with what I do. And to have that is an incredible gift. If you are, if you feel like, like you are stuck in a job that is uh, repetitive and stressful and boring, it is how you are looking at it as well. Okay. That is something else to think about. Um, some people will say that about coding that is repetitive, stressful, and boring. It depends on the environment that they're in and how they are looking at the job or their career. Okay. Because not everybody has the same viewpoint. So it really is entirely up to the person and it's entirely part party partly the environment as well okay and i got time for one more question before this thing cuts me off <laughs> um what about those of us who this is the last question what about those of us who can't relocate for a job due to family responsibilities so if you've watched my videos um i had to relocate after my first assignment okay now i'm telling you guys my story i have never said that you need to relocate I've never said that, okay? So be clear with what I'm saying. This is my story that I'm sharing with you guys that I had to move. If people find jobs in their hometowns all the time, I just wasn't able to find a job in my hometown at the time, at that time, okay? So if you're able to find a job in your hometown, then great, but don't misunderstand what I'm saying, okay? I'm sharing with you my experiences, and what you do with this information is entirely up to you. But these are my experiences. This is, this is what I went through. So if you don't want to move, then don't move. Okay. And then the next one is the second part of that question was, does anybody hire newly credentialed uh, recent graduates for remote medical coder positions? I understand that email isn't a good mode of communication for a new coder to ask questions, but what about instant messaging and phone calls? Here's the deal. No, if you are brand new and you're applying with a remote coding company, you're not going to get a call back. 
And this is just a quirky thing that happens in this field, okay? You have to have experience before you're remote coding. However, because of the pandemic, there are concessions right now. If you go and apply at a place that you have to go, nine times out of 10 right now, they're gonna send you home because they know we are in a pandemic, but they still need people. They still need coders. So still apply because I have a viewer, a couple of viewers actually now that got jobs and they're, they, this is their first job and they said, okay, we're sending you home. So they're working from home. So if they can do it and they're thriving, okay, then, you know, so on and so forth. But with remote coding companies that are actually remote, that are, you're remote, no. Um, it, and that's just the way that this industry is because you're going to have to ask questions when you first start. And according to this, uh, even, even with email, think about it, instant message, you still have to formulate the question. And when you're formulating the question, sometimes it is difficult to put it into words. <laughs> You know, I know I struggled with that. At first I was like, uh, there was like a couple of questions that I was like, I can't really, I don't know how to ask this. So, you know, I was able to ask it, you know, but, but think about it, guys, you know, you're, you're not going to sit there and call somebody 10 times a day because you're having a question. You will have questions when you're brand new. So it's always better to be in a group and not immediately at home. Okay. This is not one of those ones that you can immediately be at home. Even though, yes, it's a little different right now, but there's concessions for those things. So that's it. I'm going to go ahead and wrap this one up because this thing is going to cut me off. <laughs> but uh, I hope you enjoyed the show. Guys, I am blunt. That is that is, that is is who I am. I don't mean it in a, in a harsh way. I just mean it in a straightforward way because I'd rather give you guys the truth than to fill your head with something that is just a fantasy. Okay. All right. I'm going to go ahead and wrap this one up. So. Uh, if you're a medical coder, a medical coding student, somebody curious about the fascinating world of medical coding, a provider or a nurse, I invite you to like and subscribe and follow me on my journey in medical coding. I will see y'all next time. Bye.